first and last name, spell them out, and then give us your title. All right. My name is Tyler Collins, T-Y-L-E-R-C-O-L-L-I-N-S. I'm the epidemiologist at the City of Midland Health Department. We're going to start with, can you tell us what botulism is? Yeah. So botulism is a bacteria that lives in the soil. It produces spores that, um, if ingested by infants who don't have the gut bacteria built up to combat it, um, can cause inf uh, toxins to grow and can cause serious problems. Um, it can also grow in improperly canned or preserved food. Uh, leading to people to ingest those toxins that are growing in those jars or cans and then getting sick. And so that, that's foodborne botulism that's typically uh, associated with adults. So those are the two ways it can be contracted? Yes, yeah, so foodborne um, through ingested by adults usually, and then infant botulism, they ingest the spores and the toxins grow in their, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. in their gut. <laughs> Uh, do you have any confirmation on what caused these cases of infant botulism? So through our investigation and the lab results that, we've, uh, that we have from the State Health Department, um, we have not identified a single source for these uh, cases based off of the lab results and the investigation. There does not seem to be a common source of exposure in our conversations with the State Health Department and the California uh, in Infant Botulism Treatment and Prevention Program, who dispenses the antitoxin that is used to treat across the U.S. infant botulism cases. Um, our conversations with both of those entities indicates that because the toxin types are different, there's not a common source of exposure. So you would say that it was not contracted. You wouldn't confirm that it's contracted from the air. It's not... We believe it to be an environmental source, so it could be due to dusty air, dirty air. It could be a pacifier dropped in the dirt and then put in a child's mouth. It could be um, dirty hands handling a bottle that the child then feeds upon. Um, all of those we would consider environmental source because it's contact with the dirt, the soil that the infant uh, is getting the toxin from. Uh, we don't believe it to be foodborne, which would be something like honey ingestion or formula ingestion, something like that. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that uh, testing process in, yeah. in, in the air and also for uh, food? Yes, yeah, so environmental testing is not typically done. Um, if a food source is indicated, so honey, if they had all consumed the same brand of honey or they all consumed the same brand of formula, we would try and locate that lot number or batch number and try and get that to the state health department to test. Um, but because the consumption patterns of all infants was different, um, that was not something that uh, the state health department requested. Um, so would you say that there's any concern for the area? I mean, I think it, with a serious illness like this, I think parents sh should always be aware. They should know of the signs and symptoms to watch out for. Um, you know, the worst thing you want to have happen is, is your child comes home from the hospital and gets a serious illness. And so knowing the signs and symptoms to watch out for, knowing to maybe limit outdoor activities on especially windy or dusty days would be, um, would be kind of what parents, this, the steps they, they should take. Do you want to, is there any other preventative measures that you would have parents take? Yes, yeah, so infants under the age of one should not consume honey because honey can carry the spores. And so that's a very common you know, piece of advice with infant botulism. Um, thankfully, most of the time nowadays, because that advice has been so commonly given, most parents know not to feed their children honey. Um, but that is something to be aware of. The other advice is you know, if you're gardening or doing yard work, wash your hands before handling pacifiers or bottles just to try and limit that exposure as much as, much as you can. Um, so to that treatment, let's say mm -hmm. it is contracted, can you talk a little bit about what the treatment looks like for this disease? Yeah. So when a physician suspects infant botulism, the steps that they undertake, they call the state health department first. And they ask them to consult on it. The state health department loops in the California infant botulism um, prevention and testing program, um, and they dispense the antitoxin, which if they decide it meets the criteria that it's likely an infant botulism case, they will dispatch the antitoxin and it will arrive at the hospital usually within 24 hours. Um, and so in all of these cases, if, uh, the antitoxin had already been flown, was in the process of being distributed to the hospitals by the time we were made aware because of how quick that process is. And so 
usually that's about the time that we are made aware is when California, the program there gives the say so, you know, yes, we're going to dispense the antitoxin. That's when we were kind of looped in, hey, this is an infant, uh, suspect infant botulism case. So you were on it right when you were? Yes. Be. Yeah. So as soon as, you know, as soon as it was suspected enough to contact California, that's when we were notified. On my end. Uh, what would you like to say to the parents who may be now fearful of botulism in the area? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something to be aware of. I mean, I understand it's, it's a scary illness, having your child um, stop feeding, you know, weak cry, the child has, uh, loses their uh, use of their limbs, there's a temporary paralysis that sets in. All of those things are scary. It leads, in most cases, to intubation um, at the hospital. Um, and so it's something to be aware of. It's something to know the signs and symptoms for, to take these certain precautions that you can. Um, but this, it's a widespread bacteria in the soil. Um, it's difficult to pinpoint exact sources of it. So it's something to be aware of, but most infants don't get it. The cases are rare. Um, and so it's not something to be, it's something to be aware of, but it's, not something that most infants have to deal with. Um, lastly, on my end, does the city have a plan in, in event that more cases arise in the area? Yes, so if more cases arise, we'll of course conduct you know, investigation. Unfortunately, the testing does take quite a long time. Uh, one of these cases where you're still pending confirmation of the test results just because it has to go to the state health department, their lab, and then they might forward it onto the CDC lab for additional testing. And so once, you know, we would, of course, conduct our investigation, look for any links to these other cases and see if perhaps, you know, there are those links. If we do identify something to be uh, concerned about, we would, of course, let the public know. Um, but the real confirmation that cases might be linked is the toxin types that the lab test would reveal. And unfortunately, we don't usually have those results. Like, as I said, we don't have the full results for one of the cases. And so we do kind of have a, a delay on that as, as far as confirmation that cases are linked. Yeah. Marcus, you go ahead. Um, um, that's all I have. I don't know. Um, so can you go ahead and lay out the timeline of the cases? I understand that this started even back in August, um, and we had two um, this year. Can you, can you lay out the timeline a little bit? Yes. So since the start of 2023, we've had three cases. We had one in August of 2023. We had one in January of 2024. And then we had one um, at the very beginning of February this year. And so those are the three cases that we've had. Um, I know there has been some speculation about another case, but we, uh, if there was another case, it was not reported to us. And I've spoken with the hospital that that case was supposedly at. They don't have any indication of, of any cases last year besides the August one. So this specific case, um, this is a rare type of botulism, correct? Infant botulism is actually the most common form of botulism. Um, it's more common than foodborne botulism and more common than um, the, the very rare wound botulism, which is very few cases of that, but it's mostly infant botulism is the main, force of, uh, main form of botulism. Okay. And um, so we were, we were hearing reports that um, of the four reported cases in the state of Texas, two of them are in the same neighborhood in Midland. Um, is there, do you think there's a reason why there, that of all the places in Texas in general, um, they're in these, this one neighborhood? Yeah, so um, like we said, we have not determined a common source among the three cases. Uh, we, of course, you know, are investigating any possible links. You know, there is this geographic clustering that is, of course, of uh, concern, of note. And so we're trying to uncover if there's any reason for that. But uh, this far, and because of the toxin test results, we don't believe that there is a common source of exposure. And so as for why, you know, Midland is seeing two of the four cases. Uh, the state health department doesn't know, we don't know, and so we're still trying to uncover why exactly that might be. Is there maybe, sorry, okay, I was gonna say, I know that last year there were like 10 cases, I think in the state of Texas, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit concerning that three of the, the three are, have now been in, from this area. Mm -hmm. Do you think, have you heard anything, seen anything that this may be a rising issue just in general, not just our area? 
Yeah, so over the last five years, the state of Texas has averaged 10 cases. And so last year we saw 10 cases. This year, of course, we've already had four and we're almost through the third month of the year. So, and we still have a long way to go. And so we're not sure, are we seeing more cases this year or are we just seeing a certain uh, distribution in the year? Are we seeing most of the cases or, you know, about half of the cases now and we will have fewer later? Unfortunately, until you know more time passes and we see how many more cases there are, we don't know for sure. Um, we'll of course keep following that. We will. I've been in contact with the state health department many times, and will continue to be just to try and keep me updated, keep us, the Midland Health Department, updated about: Are we seeing more cases? Is this a you know unique situation to Midland, or is Texas as a whole seeing more cases? So. You might mention it earlier, but what are the symptoms? Yeah, so the main uh, symptoms are constipation, poor feeding, um, or a weak uh, sucking. So maybe, you know, the child isn't latching on well. Other things can be uh, droopy eyelids or a weak cry, um, as well as dilated or sluggishly reactive pupils, poor head control, and respiratory difficulty. Uh, and so those are the main symptoms. And how old were the um, infants that were reported? Yeah, all of our cases were younger than six months, which is typical of most infant botulism cases. And um, I was seeing that this type of botulism might be fatal. Um, what are, what's the status of the uh, infants as of right now, if you know? So as of right now, all infants are uh, discharged from the hospital. Um, and as far as we're aware, have, uh, are on the you know, process of recovery, but are no longer in the hospital. And this was a question that my boss had. So do we know if these infants were eating solid food, bottle fed, um, breastfed? Do we mm -hmm. know that? Yeah, so and one reason we have determined that it is not, a, one of the reasons we've kind of determined is not a common source of exposure or foodborne related. As I said, none of them had honey consumption. One of them was exclusively breastfed. One of them was exclusively formula fed. One of them had a mix of both. And the ones that had a mix of, or the ones that consumed formula consumed different types of formula. And so there was no consistency as far as the foodborne exposures. Um, based off of our investigation, I can't go into specifics about each case, but there was not a common source of exposure. And so other things have been stated publicly, but based off of our investigation, there was not a common source of exposure. You said that state health agencies have been involved, but what about TCEQ? Has, has they been at all? So TC, uh, TCEQ is not typically involved in infant botulism cases. If they would get involved, that's something that the state health department might rope them in on. Um, environmental testing is not typically done in, by the state health department in the cases of infant botulism. Um, as I mentioned, the bacteria is widespread in the environment. We could theoretically test different environmental sources, but there is no guarantee. It, it might be detected, but it doesn't guarantee that that was the source of exposure or that those toxin types match the toxin types of our cases. I think that's it. If we missed anything that you would like to say or touch on, um, you hit everything, I think. But yeah, let's case, see. Uh, yeah, I mean, just reiterate that the steps parents can take is to, to not uh, feed their children honey when they're under one year of age, to limit outdoor exposure on especially windy or dusty days, and um, to make sure that they're washing their hands between handling pacifiers, feeding bottles, and doing gardening or yard work. So that would be just reiterating that. Mm -hmm. 